In 2007, South Park released their first ever fully continuous trilogy of episodes with season 11's Imagination Land. While the show had done a handful of two-parters before, including Cartoon Wars and Go God Go in the season immediately prior, this felt like one of South Park's most ambitious pieces of storytelling in series history. The entire concept of Imagination Land is massive, whisking the kids away on a fantasy adventure unlike anything we'd seen in South Park up to that point. But not only was this trilogy ambitious and well-received, eventually it was recut and re-released on DVD and streaming, advertised as a single movie. This new version included extended sequences, uncensored jokes and visuals, and occasionally entirely new footage. Imagination Land remains some of my favorite episodes that South Park has ever offered, so today I want to talk about the inception of the idea, the differences in the quote-unquote movie version, and how this style of storytelling affected the show moving forward. Haven't you boys ever used your imagination? Okay, but first, imagine these on your shelf. Today's video is actually brought to you by YouTubes, and let me tell you, this is the coolest and most fitting sponsorship I've ever had. Look at these South Park figures. I actually have a lot of other South Park merchandise, and nothing else even remotely comes close to the quality of these YouTubes figures. Their current collection has some great stuff, including Tegrity Randy, All of the Good Times with Weapons Boys, Man Bear Pig, Tweak and Craig, so many more. And starting today, they're releasing their new collection that includes St. Patrick's Day Towley, PP, Real Estate Cartman, PC Principal, and Pajama Cartman. I will 100% be getting PC Principal and Real Estate Cartman. The thing about U2s is that every single figure is limited edition, so once they're gone, they're gone forever. Rest in peace, Grandpa Marsh. But you can get 10% off the South Park collection with the code SPYTZ10. This code is only good for seven days starting on April 20th, so act fast. Head over to U2s.com or click the link in my description and check out these limited edition South Park figures today. You will not regret it. That code again is SPYTZ10. The idea of having terrorists attack our imaginations was one Matt and Trey had for a while before producing this trilogy. In fact, they thought the idea of Imagination Land was so big that they could have potentially used it for their next movie if they had ever done one. Well, maybe it could be the next movie if we ever wanted to do a movie again, so we kind of always kept it in our back pocket. But midway through production on season 11, they were running low on ideas and decided, whatever, let's just do Imagination Land. Though, initially, they had just fully planned on it being a single episode, which is hard to imagine. Obviously, it eventually became a full trilogy. But like much of South Park's production, they didn't plan these episodes out in advance. They only realized midway through the first episode that it would need to be at least two parts, and even funnier, they didn't realize until making part two that they needed it to be a full trilogy. I watched these episodes live as they aired, and I remember during the credits of part one, the Comedy Central announcer said, tune in next week to catch the exciting conclusion, which made my viewing of part two very confusing. As they approached the end of the episode, I kept thinking, there's no way they're gonna be able to wrap this thing up so quickly. And sure enough, off, that's how I learned it was a trilogy. Damn, I kind of miss the simpler age of appointment TV, don't you? But man, the Imagination Land trilogy has always just been one of my favorite South Park stories. I remember at the time just being blown away by the entire idea of Imagination Land. Not only was it just so much fun conceptually, it was pretty mind-blowing that they could pull it off at all legally. But from the start, the first part had me hooked with the immediate twist that Cartman wasn't just messing with everyone. There actually was a leprechaun, leading to Kyle losing his bet and having to, uh, well, we all know what he's supposed to do to Cartman. The entire trilogy trilogy does such a good job balancing the big epic ambitious storyline of Imagination Land with the more grounded character driven story of Cartman trying to humiliate Kyle, which to me is something that all of my favorite South Park episodes have. Yeah, there has to be a fun and engaging story going on or a piece of commentary that makes me laugh, but the best episodes have stakes for the characters. Even though the entire Kyle plus Cartman's ball storyline is very silly, it absolutely has major stakes for both of them. We had a deal, Kyle! But admittedly, the part of the story I love most is definitely Imagination Land itself, in no small part because it focuses on butters. The kids are taken to Imagination Land by the mayor and his big airship, singing the Imagination Land song, of course. Imagination. And Imagination Land is quickly attacked by terrorists. The kids manage to escape on a dragon, all except for Butters, who is left behind. In the commentary, Matt Stone talked about the larger inspirations for this kind of story. Kind of like the Narnia movies, and like, of course, the big one being Harry Potter, where a kid gets taken from his shitty normal life and taken to this wonderful world where they are 
a prince or a king or a special. And this is the exact reason that Butters is the perfect character to have this happen to. His life at home is so sad and awful. Cartman and the other kids treat him terribly. His parents constantly ground him. He just cannot ever catch a break. So he's the exact candidate to put into this kind of story. But they also don't really let him off the hook entirely. He still gets beaten up by terrorists and has to experience a ton of traumatic events to find out that he's special. He can't just save the day with a heartfelt speech. That was your plan to stop them? Yeah, a nice little heartfelt speech. That's f stupid! But man, just about everything in Imagination Land itself is so much fun to experience. There are just countless characters you recognize, from Totoro to The Flash to Count Chocula. Easter egg YouTube channels would have had an absolute field day with these episodes if they came out today. Would y'all watch an every Easter egg video for Imagination Land? Eesh, that would be a huge undertaking. But I think even more fun than the imaginary characters themselves is the way the show was then able to bring back ideas from its own history that fit the premise. Getting to actually see Man Bear Pig fully realized, and of course, possibly possibly best of all, the return of the Woodland Critters, who only existed in Cartman's Christmas story previously. Just a genius way to be able to reintroduce them naturally in this story. Another thing I loved is how they incorporated the government into the dilemma, showing them to be completely inept in the funniest ways. One of my favorite moments is when this agent doesn't understand a superior is using sarcasm. Good job, Tom! Why don't you just tell him everything about Project X? Yes, sir. We built a portal to the imagination to use against the Russians during the Cold War. God, it's just such a funny runner. This kills me every time. All right, we might as well show it to him. God damn it, Tom. I also love that Project Imagination Doorway is just a stargate, great visual, and bringing back the Imagination song to activate it, it was just the one thing the government was missing. I always really love the scene where Kyle dies and Cartman brings him back to life. The idea that he only wants to save Kyle's life just so that he can humiliate him, that's perfectly Cartman. Plus, it always felt like there was just so much emotion behind Cartman's performance here. No! No, he has a strong heart! He wants to live! Of course, it wasn't actually until recently that I realized this entire sequence is basically word for word from James Cameron's The Abyss, which, in my defense, is a very hard movie to watch for some reason. Not like because it's a bad movie, it's just literally on zero streaming services, paid or free, and it hasn't been on physical media since DVD. So needless to say, when I finally saw it recently, that sequence blew my mind a little bit. Also, that movie rules, you should check it out. I'm a huge fan of the way they brought back Al Gore here too, making him spearhead the government's plan to nuke the imagination, just so he can kill man bear pig I'm off the idea behind Butter's imagination powers worked really well for me too. Since he's a real kid, he's the only one in Imagination Land with the powers to imagine and create new characters. He has to hone them, but he eventually brings back Santa Claus and manages to imagine spinach for Popeye and M80 for Jesus. He's out in the battlefield helping everyone. I also just loved the idea behind the Council of Nine, the most respected and powerful imaginary characters all in charge of Castle Sunshine. At the time, I remember being slightly annoyed that Jesus was on the council, not because I'm religious, but because Jesus is canonically real in South Park. But I really I really enjoyed Matt and Trey's explanation for why they made this decision, even if they felt it maybe wasn't quite properly conveyed. The idea that, to them, Jesus might be imaginary, but that doesn't mean that he isn't important. He's like all of these other imaginary characters who mean something to people. Jesus is another one of those stories, and, you know, just another sort of imaginary character that matters because these stories matter and they, they teach us things. And this lines up really well with Kyle's final speech in the episode, which is so affecting because basically Kyle has to sacrifice his own well-being with the Cartman situation in order to save his friends in Imagination Land by arguing that imaginary things actually are real. Haven't Luke Skywalker and Santa Claus affected your lives more than most real people in this room? Of course, Al Gore still nukes the imagination and Butters has to imagine it all back at the end. But honestly, the very final beat is a perfect little Butters moment. After failing to try and use his imagination powers on his parents. That only works in Imagination Land. You're grounded. Oh, shit. Truly a perfect way to end this kind of story for Butters. He was the kid with the terrible life who got whisked away to the magical place where he had special powers and abilities, but of course, he's still Butters. It wouldn't be South Park if Butters had a happy life. Man, there really is just so much to say about this trilogy. It's such a fun series of episodes. And the year following its TV premiere, a slightly longer, uncensored director's cut was released on DVD and even promoted as a DVD movie. Though the DVD wasn't in high def, it was released in widescreen, which I believe at the time made it 
only the second episode of South Park to be re-released in a larger aspect ratio. In 2007, Good Times with Weapons was re-released in HD on Xbox Live and HD DVD as a promotional bonus. The original Imagination Land episodes would obviously also be re-rendered into high def for the Blu-ray and streaming release, but those HD versions contain none of the changes from the uncensored Blu-ray. So there are three formats the trilogy can be watched in, original full screen, remastered widescreen, and of course the uncensored director's cut. Though it was only released on DVD and not Blu-ray, an HD version of the uncensored director's cut was eventually released on streaming. At the moment, the only way I know of to watch this version in high def legally is through the Microsoft Store, and even then it has to be watched on Xbox 360, mobile, PC, or HoloLens. It's kind of a mess. It feels like they should probably release this on streaming somewhere. Paramount Plus, get on that. As far as the changes to the uncensored version go, there are some that are substantial, some completely unsubstantial, and some that are seemingly just different for the sake of it. The total runtime is about 67 minutes, three and a half minutes longer than the three episodes strung together, so here I'm mostly going to go over the more substantial changes. It opens on a brand new, more cinematic shot of the town that pans down into the forest, whereas the original version just began right in the forest. In one of the Stranger changes, where Kyle was sitting on a log before, he's now just standing in front of it. The entire scene's blocking changes slightly to accommodate this. A new Irish chase melody is played during the leprechaun chase sequence too. Later at Kyle's house, when Cartman is trying to get him to fulfill the contract, we get a little extra dialogue from Ike. Yay, Kyle's gonna suck balls. When they arrive in Imagination Land for the first time when we see the super best friends, they actually removed Joseph Smith, presumably because there is such concrete historical confirmation that he was a real person, despite this version having ice breath abilities. But also having the super best friends there at all is once again South Park contradicting itself since we've seen them as canonically real South Park characters. There's a little extra Jimmy dialogue as they fly into Imagination Land 2. Wow, this is incredible and totally f up at the same time. The initial terrorist attack in Imagination Land is also a lot more intense. You see Dorothy get brutally murdered. You can see a lot more during the Saving Private Ryan inspired sequence. When the government asks Hollywood directors for help, Michael Bay now has a series of papers that he throws around when imitating his special effects. At the end of the first part, there's this new series of dialogue where Jimmy asks Cartman if he might be pursuing the balls thing with Kyle for physical pleasure, and Cartman fully goes off on him. This is about humiliation, people. This is about Kyle finally having to admit he was wrong. There's a lot more to this sequence too. You should definitely seek out this version of the movie. The second part previously opened with a previously on segment and then a very simple episode two title as they dissolve into Butter's room. But this time it features a massive epic sweeping shot, Lord of the Rings style, swooping over the mountains of South Park and showing the title, The Drying of the Balls before landing inside Butter's window. There is a pretty fun and brutal shot of Mickey Mouse's head exploding as the evil characters breach the other side of Imagination Land. This is another example of a character who would later turn out to be real in South Park lore. There's a sequence that got censored for TV where Strawberry Shortcake is tortured by the evil characters. It still appears in the TV version, but it's cut down significantly and much less gruesome. I can't even show it fully here. The outside of Castle Sunshine gets a really nice landscaping makeover in the uncensored version. The waters and pathways, they all look a lot better. The TV version of the third episode begins with a recap spoken by Aslan, but the uncensored version opts for a quick Star Wars style text crawl, and it ends by calling themselves out by saying things can become about as lame and unimaginative as a parody of Star Wars. The director's cut also does great revamps to the entire battle of Castle Sunshine. Right before the battle begins, we see a quick additional shot of some more evil characters, including Venom, Darkseid, Cobra Commander, Sauron, and okay, I gotta push back on this one because Oscar the Grouch is not evil. He's just a poor grouchy guy who lives in a trash can. Poor Oscar. We can also see some new good characters behind Jesus like Peter Pan and Harry Potter. This entire sequence has just tons of characters swapped out or added. It seems to have had the most cosmetic alterations done in the entire special. Definitely worth watching if you can get your hands on it. When Butters grants Jesus his M80 in this version, we actually get to see Jesus take out the Xenomorph with the M80. And the entire thing ends a bit differently too. After Butters reimagines all of Imagination Land and Cartman does... Well, we know. Everyone starts singing the Imagination Land song together. So while there aren't any changes that really fundamentally alter the DNA of Imagination Land, there are some pretty substantial changes overall. It's definitely a different experience in a lot of ways. But the big question is, does it work as it was advertised on the DVD, as a movie? And to that I say, eh, not really. It's certainly a bigger experience than the TV version, and I do really love a lot of the additions cinematically. The new opening shot of the town, the additions to the Battle of Castle Sunshine, the big sweeping shot of the beginning of part two, these all work really in its favor to make it 
feel like a bigger event. Even the new ending with all the imaginary characters singing the Imagination Land song together is very reminiscent of the end of Bigger, Longer, and Uncut when everyone is singing together before the credits roll, but overall you can still just feel that this is segmented into three episodes. They still utilize full-on title cards to differentiate the split between parts one, two, and three, and it doesn't really feel like a seamless or continuous story even re-edited. In my opinion, it would have had to have been a much more substantial overhaul for it to feel like an actual film. Let's just say in structure, it feels much more Stewie Griffin the Untold Story than Bender's Big Score. But I do think that this trilogy actually would end up influencing how Matt and Trey would write South Park in the future. Obviously, I've done an entire video about their history of serialized story elements and how they dabbled in it for years before trying it out more thoroughly in later seasons, but the commentary for these episodes in this movie shed a bit more light into the writing process and how Trey was inspired by other types of TV at the time. I had a really good time doing this because I think some of the best writing to come out of Hollywood these days is, is the drama TV shows, you know, like the 24s and Lost and things like that. And this makes a lot of sense based on how each part of this trilogy ends. None of them end on a what is going to happen cliffhanger. They all tend to end on a more of a oh shit that just happened cliffhanger. Part one doesn't end with oh no will the terrorists blow up the wall? It ends with them blowing up the wall. Part two doesn't end with Kyle possibly being dead on the floor. It ends with Cartman actually saving his life and then Kyle waking up being confronted by Cartman. But the funny thing is that while Trey enjoyed doing it, he also said this. I had I had fun writing this stuff because it was just, you know, a different way to think about stuff. I don't want to do it again. Um. I don't think. <laughs> but of course, they would eventually go on to write a couple more trilogies over their long run. The Coon and Friends trilogy in season 14, the Black Friday trilogy in season 17, but even bigger was their attempts at a fully serialized season in season 20. It felt like they had to try to write an entire season of South Park in a similar way that Trey describes for the Imagination Land trilogy here, which of course is generally agreed to have been a bit of a failure, largely due to things out of their control. But it does feel like they're now continuing to tell these bigger stories with cliffhanger endings through the Paramount plus specials. So it's at the very least super interesting to see how their feelings on these writing styles have evolved and how the writing itself has changed over time. Personally, I would love to see something as ambitious as the Imagination Land trilogy in these Paramount plus specials. I wouldn't even hate a direct follow-up, a return to Imagination Land, if you will, if they had an inspired idea, of course. Post-COVID definitely feels like the closest they've gotten in recent seasons to a massive ambitious event. I really like those two specials and I'd love to see more of that energy, but Imagination Land is still one of my favorite stories ever told in South Park history. So I think we should probably close this out the only way we possibly could. Thank you.